I took a ceramic class every semester that I was in college, and that was always my class that I went to. That was my fun class, and that's where I really wanted to be. But I didn't think I could continue that after school, and I just continued with my geology major and thought that would be my career. Um, but then my senior year, when I was trying to really figure out where to go after school, I just wanted to make pots. So I talked to my professors about how to go about doing that, and they suggested residencies. And that's when I found out about Cub Creek. Cub Creek is this great program out in rural Virginia. We pretty much live in the woods alone. Um, where residents can come and we have large studio spaces and we have our big wood kiln but the only requirement of the residency is that we make enough pieces and we split enough wood to fire our kilns every couple months and other than that we have complete creative control over what we decide to focus on and we have we have kilns everywhere we have any material we could want we have this beautiful studio and it's just this great open space where you can really be introspective and think about your creative process in terms of what you want to do instead of with having these other stipulations put on you like in other programs. At Cub Creek I'm really able to make pots that are truly earth to table because here we we dig up our own native clay from the property just outside of dig it up, sieve it, and then mix it into our other materials to make our clay bodies. It literally is like from the earth to your table when you have a finished piece that you can use. I dig up my clay and then I put it in a bucket and then I cover that with water and let it slake for a while, which is where you just let water kind of get into all the particles. And then you take a drill and you mix it all up. So that's a big like wet mix. And then I sieve that so that I can get all the rocks and leaves and junk out of it. And then I can take that mix of the wet native clay by itself and put that into our clay mixer with all the other materials that I'm using based on whatever recipe for the clay I've decided to pick. And then I mix up the clay, then I bag it up, take it back to our studio, and then I actually make pieces with it. So once I actually have my pieces all thrown and finished and everything's attached, then I have to bisque fire them. And then when that's all done, um, you glaze them and then you have to wad them for the wood kiln, which means you have to put them on little stilts of a clay that's mixed with a material that has a very high melting point so it's not going to melt with the rest of the stuff in the kiln. And that way your piece won't get stuck to the kiln itself when it's in there really hot. What I found is really cool about Cub Creek versus being in school making pots is that in school, you have a lot of decisions made for you, like you have a rubric and you have certain projects you have to complete. Your clay is decided for you, you just use the shop clay. Your glazes are decided for you, you use the shop glazes. The kiln firings are scheduled for you, so you have that schedule already in place. And then a lot of the times, even the firings are taken care of for you. But then in a place like Cub Creek, where you are as a resident, you make all those decisions completely on your own, starting from the clay that you use and how you want to mix it to like when the kiln firing will be and how long you want to fire the kiln for and you know what types of wood you want to throw in at what times to determine different types of surfaces so the whole process is really taken on by you instead of decided for you which has been really cool i wasn't necessarily thinking of like my life in a greater scale of like where i was going to go with it and now I'm at this program where there's an infinite number of clay recipes that I could use. And I've done some experimentation with different types of clays that uh, I was excited about. They came out of the kiln and I thought, oh, I don't really like these very much. <laughs> uh, I don't know, it can be discouraging, but it, you just kind of have to keep going and see, think about why you don't like it and what you can change to keep moving forward. I had been doing my fasting technique for probably like two or three years, because that's what I kind of did throughout school as my, like my like feature was that technique. Um, and I, even though I love that and I think I could still grow by continuing to experiment with that, I was starting to feel like that was kind of a crutch that I was leaning on and I was like, oh my gosh, what if I can only make these pots and I'll, I can't do anything else? So after that first firing, 
I cut myself off from that technique and I told myself I'm not gonna do that anymore. And even though I didn't necessarily have a plan for what I was going to do, it was good that I cut myself off because it forced me to experiment in different ways and to branch out to new techniques. And now I think the body of work that I've made since that point is infinitely stronger than what I was already doing. So I'm glad that I kind of forced myself to stop <laughs> that. <laughs>pretty much entirely motivated by geology and my experiences studying geology in college. Um, I studied structural geology which focuses on how rocks deform and how how they've been acted upon by different forces throughout time and I think there's a lot of parallels between that and handmade ceramics because in a lot of cases you can look at a rock and you could study the structural aspects of that rock to kind of figure out the forces that have acted upon it. And in ceramics, you can kind of do the same thing. There's the same kind of indicators that you can look for on how the piece has moved, how it's been cut or acted upon. And so I think that's really interesting. So I try to find different ways to have the same threads of structural geology be seen through my ceramics. You know, different clay deposits are gonna be different based on the rocks that weathered to create the clay. You know, different landscapes are created by different geological processes, just like different pieces of ceramics are made with different ceramic processes. A couple different ways that I try to make geological looking surfaces for my work. Um, one of them is I like to facet my pieces, which is where I literally take a piece of wire when my piece is on the wheel and I cut chunks off of it in a very like harsh looking way. And then I stretch the piece from the inside and you can see where the clay, like maybe it started with a cut that was straight and then I stretch it and it ends up like getting a wave in it because of the stretching process. Which is really cool because you can look at that and you can see the deformation of the clay as I was making the piece. And something that I've just noticed recently as I've been kind of evaluating my time here at Cub Creek so far compared to my time in school and college and everything is in college I was studying structural geology which is like mountains and earthquakes and um, like brittle and ductile deformation. And I did a lot of field work in Oman where there were some really brittle mountains and my pots kind of looked more chunky and brittle and um, they had like harsh ridges and everything. And I've noticed that here, I've gravitated towards making pots that are a little bit more soft and they have like more flowing, you know, lips or the slip marks are a little bit more uh, flowing. Uh, and I think that could be partly because here I'm immersed in this environment where we have rolling hills that I drive by every day to get to the grocery store and like it's just like a softer environment than the stress in school and the stress of doing my thesis and learning about all these different harsh geological processes and so it's cool to like look back and see how those things I was doing at the time it influenced the pots I was wanting to make. to Cub Creek for me was that this is a wood fire residency and I've been wanting to learn about that whole process for a while so that's something that drew me here is wood firing and what's amazing about wood firing is that it takes so much work not work as in pieces but just like work overall because we have to we have to prep enough wood to fire the kiln for you know five six days and the way that we've structured it here with me and the residents that are here now is that we all do four to six hours of wood prep a week and sometimes that's not even enough so you know we spend a lot of our time splitting wood and stacking it next to the kiln and that's just one piece of that whole process the kiln itself you have to make a lot of pieces in order to fill it up so it takes months of making pots just to fill up the kiln enough to fire it and our kiln is so large that when we fire the whole thing, it takes three days just to load the kiln. And then it, this last firing we did, it took five and a half days to fire the kiln. And the whole time, there has to be somebody at the kiln watching it and attending to it that whole time, 24 seven. Um, and for us, for this last firing, that was tough because there's only four residents here and we all have jobs in the area. So it was really hard to plan our schedules in a way where we could fire this kiln. So for me, my schedule was 
I would have a shift at the kiln, I would get off at midnight, I would go to bed, I'd get up at 7, I'd go to my job, I'd get home at 1 p.m., I would be attending to the kiln until midnight, I would wake up at 7, I would go to work, I would get home at 1, I would go right to the kiln, stoke it till midnight, go to bed, and I think I was on that cycle for four days. So that, it was a never-ending kind of relentless process, and it almost like felt like a different world, like you're in this, the world of the kiln, and like the outside, everything you think about on a normal daily basis is kind of out of your mind because you're thinking about the kiln and you're in this never-ending, like, this is my life now, this kiln is what I have to think about all the time, and even when I'm at work, I'm thinking about the kiln, and when I'm asleep, I'm dreaming about the kiln, and it's just this weird process that, like, you can predict to some extent what the piece will look like based on where it is in the kiln, but also there's this huge factor of, like, mystery, where you, you've been making pots for three months to fill up the kiln, and then you put them all in there, and you don't know if they're all gonna come out good or bad, or if there's gonna be some kind of problem with your clay body that you've been using for three months where all, all the pieces that you've made are gonna maybe melt or they're all gonna crack or something's gonna happen and you don't know and that's an exciting aspect of wood firing that's a little bit nerve-wracking as well. So here's an example of how the decisions that you make throughout the process change how the piece is going to look. So this piece was made with our basic stoneware mixed with the native red clay, so I knew it would be a darker clay body than this, which is just a white stoneware. And these two pieces both have the same glaze on them. The different clay really affected how the same glaze could turn out, so that's like a decision you have to make based on what you know about the clay or maybe what you don't know about the clay. And this piece is a great example of the combination of slips that I was using because I, you know, I said I was going to stop with that faceting technique that I had been relying on for a while. And so for this piece, I used the porcelain slip, the dark stoneware slip, and the native red slip. And you can see there's areas that are kind of white, that's from the porcelain. There's areas that are like this bright red, and that's from the dark stoneware. And then all this black is the native clay by itself. And I think this piece turned out really successful and I really love the gray that I got here and the textures that I was able to get. So this is a direction that I'll definitely keep going in now that I have this firing over. So this jar is one of the first pieces that I saw when we unbricked the door of the kiln because it was right on the front stack right next to where the fire is. And something that's super cool about atmospheric firings is that based on the way the clay has flashed, you can tell the direction that the heat or that the ash or whatever was coming from. So this piece doesn't have any glaze on it, it's just the clay by itself with slips. And then the bright orange, the clay just did that because of the fire passing over it. And you can look at this piece and you can tell that the fire and the ash were coming from this direction and they moved across the piece that way. And it's cool that you can see that across like every plane of the piece where the fire was going. Um, and another thing about this piece that I really like is that here on the lid, this blue spot is um, entirely ash glazed. So we're putting wood into the kiln, it's getting hot, it's burning. The ash is getting hot enough to the point where it melts and turns into glass. And it accumulates on the bottom of the shelves that the pieces are stacked on. And so this was where a lot of ash had accumulated and it just dripped right here onto the lid and made this beautiful blue spot that if it had happened a little bit farther over, it would have it would have glued the lid to the piece and I wouldn't have been able to get the lid off, but it happened like the perfect spot right where that slip was, where the slip kind of stopped it from closing the piece shut forever. So this is like, this is a winner. So here's another piece that was right on that front stack. This piece was actually uh, on the bottom shelf, so like this is where the shelf was. The fire was here, and the fire even like came, like this piece was in the fire, in the kiln, and it kind of got buried in ash, which is where this purple came from. And the fire was so hot that it like pushed it over, and it leaned on the shelf of the kiln, and it picked up a chunk of the shelf when I took it out of the kiln. So 
the kiln like affected this piece in a way where it now has like a new part that I didn't add but the kiln did and same with this this is where the piece had leaned and it was like sitting against another pot and so this little fragment is like a piece of somebody else's pot that got stuck to mine and a lot of times that's seen as a flaw or like if your piece gets stuck to another piece that's seen as a piece you can't use or it's seen as a bad thing but I think I think in this case that works and it's pretty amazing Rather than just looking into like the cost of the materials that went into this piece or just like pricing your time that it took to make the piece, I think it's valuable to think about the piece in terms of like the place you are in your in your growth and in your life and it's so representative of what I've been working towards and what what I've been trying to figure out with my work at this time. But this is one of those that would be a lot more valuable and it's like oh, it's a representation of like where I am at this point in my life and in my ceramic career. Looking back at my time at Cub Creek so far and looking towards the future, I think about how with that first firing, I tried all these different things and I kind of had a disappointment after we unloaded because I didn't like most of those pots. But that forced me to branch out and to try something new. And this time around with this last firing, I had a lot of successes. And looking at all the pots, there's so many different routes that I can go down to explore that I feel like I've, I'm out of my rut with creativity and I think that I can really go somewhere interesting with all these different paths that I've found uh, with these new paths. So I'm just very excited to see which ones I'm going to pick and what they're going to look like next.